Well, what's going on, Mosaic? Uh, well, about six months ago, I was at a wedding for my brother-in-law. And if you've been at a wedding for people outside of your immediate family, you kind of know that you probably have to expect a, a plenty of interactions with people that you really don't know at all. And oftentimes, they are very awkward. Most of the time, they're very awkward. Like, I like to think of myself as a good conversationalist, but even still, some of these random conversations that I have with people I know nothing about at a wedding are so rough that I, like, want to step on a nail just so we'd have something to talk about. You know what I mean? You guys are there with me, right? But at this wedding in particular, I was mostly keeping to myself when an older gentleman walked up to me with another dude his age, apparently named Greg, and he walks over and he goes, hey, Greg, uh, this is Jim, the guy I was telling you about, and he points at me. And then he just walked away. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jack, not Jim, and so I was very confused, and I looked behind me like, maybe Jim's back there. There wasn't. So then I looked back, and he's already going to shake my hand, and I was like, all right, Jack, like, what kind of man do you want to be? Ready? And I shook his hand, and I said, hey, Greg, and then nothing else came out of my mouth. I don't know why. I don't know. I just panicked. I didn't correct him. I didn't correct the guy that walked away because I didn't want to like insult his intelligence by saying like, hey, he gave you wrong information. I don't know who you think I am. But nonetheless, that's what I said. And so now I find myself in a conversation with Greg while he still clearly thinks I'm somebody else. And it was probably the most awkward conversation I've ever had in my entire life. We did one of those things where you stand, like guys do this thing sometimes where you stand cross arm next to each other, but you don't look at each other, but you're talking to each other. That's what we were doing as we were like looking into this wedding, right? And we just asked questions with one word answers for a while and that's what it was just just me and just Jim and Greg <laughs> and he looked over and he goes so you in school like just like that and I was like man I don't know like is would Jim be in school like well, <laughs> but I didn't want to lie about a school subject so I was just like nope you and he goes graduated in 68 I was like, all right, I don't know what else was going on in 68, but yeah, cool. Eventually, though, we pushed through the awkward, and he talked about his wife, and he talked about his relationship with his kids that he wants to improve, and it was a really great conversation. He still thinks I'm Jim, so, you know, my bad on that, but it was a great conversation nonetheless. Now, why do I tell you this? It's because sometimes it's beneficial, it's worth it to push through the awkward, to persevere through it, to stick with it in the long haul. You see, we're wrapping up a series called Tables, where we're looking at the meals of Jesus, the times where he got together to eat with people, and we're seeing what we can glean from these interactions. As a church, we've been in an initiative called Tables to have these kinds of tables, these starts of relationships, these people, uh, these people that we have proximity with in our lives. But naturally, we have plenty of objections when it comes to hanging out with people like that. Maybe, maybe it's awkward, like the interaction I just described, right? Maybe it's a, a fear of mixing your personal and your private and your professional life all together into one. For me, my, one of my worries is that I'll be like way too much for my friends or my neighbors or just people around me. Like if you know me, if you know me well, you probably know I'm kind of like personified, you know, like that's kind of my personality. Um, and it's from my family, you know, I, my family is a bunch of Jewish, Italian, New Jerseyans, so it just runs in my blood. It's part of me. I, I once saw my dad be lifted up above their heads by a group of Navy SEALs to do a keg stand at the ripe age of 55. <laughs> and when he came back over and I asked him, why did that just happen? He goes, well, I told them they couldn't lift me. <laughs> like, that's the family I come from. That's, that's where I'm at. So yeah, that's my worries. That'll just be too much for people. Like a story that describes my family and my extended family alike and the meals, the tables that we would have together is one time I was at a family dinner at my grandpa's house. And me and a buddy were planning to go to a concert after this dinner. And so we were supposed to carpool there. So he called me while I was at this dinner. So I step into the other room and he hears all the background noise and he's like, yo, are, are you already there? And I was like, dude, I'm at family dinner at my grandpa's. Like you already think I'm at the rap concert? Like that's really how loud this is right now? But it was, it was always so fun, like me, I had so many memories uh, that all happened around a table. And for a lot of us, the tables that we will be having in these coming months aren't necessarily with family, but we still want to have meaningful and, and fun time with people to be able to open up opportunities for people to know about Jesus who don't already. So we have been looking at the meals of Jesus, seeing how his life and his examples can shape ours. And today is going to be no different. Today, we're going to zoom in on a three-year relationship that Jesus, has with his, and, uh, that Jesus has with some people and he, this meal that he has at the end of that with his boys to see how he's been 
been playing the long game this whole time. And at the end of this talk, we're gonna zoom way out to see how God, over history, has been playing the long game with us. And if you're here today and you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then you're gonna leave today with more data and more information about who Jesus is, who God is, and the role that he wants to play in your life. So first, let's take a look at what I would consider to be the most important meal, the most important table that Jesus had with his followers, and that is the Last Supper in Luke 22. For context, Jesus' ministry has been going on for about three years now, and it's nearing the time where he's going to be crucified, where he's going to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And he's having, one of the fin- he's having this final meal with his disciples, with his followers, his friends, and this is what we see in Luke 22, 14 through 16. It says, when the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So I want to make sure that we caught that, right? Like he said, I've been very eager to eat this meal with you. He's been waiting for this moment. He's been leading up to this moment. What we see Jesus doing here is evidence of more long-form evangelism. He's having a meal with the people that he has been doing life with for a long time. He's been in it. He's been living this life with his disciples. And this is not some rash, impulsive thing. This is a methodical, thoughtful, patient process. And I believe that as we look at the narrative of Scripture, it actually points us in a different direction than maybe our heart, our minds immediately jump to when we hear the word evangelism, when we think about the idea of sharing our faith. Like for a lot of us, myself included, I think about awkward encounters at the mall where someone runs up to you like freaked out and they're like, do you know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And it's like, whoa, dude, chill out. Or I think about like finding what appears to be a hundred dollar bill on the ground and being super excited. And then you take a closer look and it says million dollar bill and you're like, oh crap, it's one of these. And you flip over on the back and it says like, do you know the million dollar question about where you're gonna go when you die? And it's like, dude, now I'm not thinking about my eternal resting place. I'm just pissed off that I don't have a hundred dollars. Like that's just where I'm at. And and these methods uh, of sharing our faith, sharing Jesus with people, feel forced and weird. And when we look at the narrative of Scripture, we instead see this more thoughtful, long-haul process, doing life with people around us while sharing the amazing things that Jesus has done and is doing for us. We see a model and a call to long-form evangelism like we're talking about in this series. It's playing the long game, planning, caring over the long term, being intentional, not just at a time where you've set aside to be intentional, but throughout the long haul, throughout all of the process. When I think about this idea of a more long-form evangelism like we've been talking about throughout this series, I, I think of this flyer that I made sure to grab when I was in Burger King for lunch the other day. It said in big words across the top, get a $200 gift card to Burger King. You can imagine my excitement. I was amped. For those of you who are shaking your heads, you just don't know. You got to go. It's great. Then I look at the back of this flyer and it says there are paragraphs on paragraphs that say that in order to be eligible for this, I need to attend a 90-minute like presentation on a timeshare and why that's a good investment for me and my family. Side note, I did not get the $200 Burger King because I am not patient enough to sit through a 90-minute thing on timeshares. I will not be doing that. But the point of that is, you know, that feeling that we get when we think of a forceful timeshare salesman is, is similar to the feeling a lot of us get when talking about telling others about Jesus or inviting people to church. But I believe, and Jesus shows us, we are not called to be like annoying, manipulative, pushy timeshare salesmen, but we're also not called to be sporadic fire hoses of the story of who Jesus is. As followers of Christ, if you are one, we are called to be people who live on mission and continue to take the amazing news of what Jesus has done for this world to this world over the long haul. And this is what the Initiative of Tables is pushing us towards, long-form evangelism. And we see our model, our example in Jesus play this, play this method out for us. If you read in the Gospels, the accounts of Jesus, we see him passing through towns, changing lives as he goes. But throughout all of it, we also see the same people with him. In that first verse that we looked at, it's a really easy thing to ignore. But if we look at it again, Luke 22, 14, it says, When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at a table. It's the apostles, those guys who have been with him for the last three years, the people he did life with. This is Peter, this is John, this is Andrew, it's Philip, it's it's Thomas, it's Bartholomew, it's Matthew, it's Simon, it's it's two guys both named James, two guys both named Judas. I know we're like, wait, two Judases? What about that? Whatever. It's not just like random 12 people who happen to be with him at the culmination of all these events that end in this massively important table. Luke 6.13, earlier in the book of Luke, it says, when the day came, he called his disciples. He chose from them 12 who he named apostles. 
He chose these 12. He stuck with them. And we have hundreds of verses of Jesus caring for them and meeting their needs and challenging them and encouraging them. And then we get to the story of the table that he's having with them. But there are two things that I want us to see in Jesus in this table that will help us do this as well. And the first is this. We must be patient. We must be patient. Now, obviously, Jesus was patient with his disciples. We just said they've been together for years. But there's more to this point. Look, like, look at this more of this passage with me in Luke 22. It says, But here at this table, sitting among us as a friend, is the man who will betray me. He's talking about Judas. For it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays me? The disciples began to ask each other which of them would ever do such a thing. Then they began to argue among themselves who among them is the greatest. Jesus told them, in this, world, the great, in this world, the kings and great men lord over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leaders should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. So why be patient? Why be patient in this? The first reason is because it is hard to believe. It's hard to believe. Sometimes it's our shame that tells us that it's just not possible. Or maybe it's we live in a world that's so counter to who Jesus is and what he offers. Like, think about it. Of course your friend isn't going to believe right away. Jesus himself lived with these dudes, and even they didn't get it. So to expect someone who doesn't yet know him to be gung-ho, ready to follow him perfectly, and deeply understand the depths of his love and forgiveness is probably not going to happen right away. We have to be patient because it's hard to believe. When we step into the world of sharing our faith, we have to know it doesn't always just end with people immediately seeing the hope and the grace that Jesus offers and they change their whole lives so they can work better to follow him better. Even when done in long-form evangelism over years, that doesn't always happen. There will be plenty of times where people get it wrong. And we see that here. Jesus himself has been leading these men and one of them even is about to betray him. Is about to look past the amazing things that he offers and fall into his own selfish desires. This is moments before Judas betrays Jesus. And yet still, Jesus still takes time to invite him to this meal. Jesus' intentionality and his care and his proximity with Judas is not based upon whether he does or does not do the things that he ought to to follow Jesus, and neither should ours. It takes patience. It takes patience when you've been praying for that friend that still shuts down the conversation every single time Jesus is brought up. It takes patience when you think you're making progress with a neighbor and then they take five steps back. It takes patience when you finally get your family member to come to church and you think it's awesome and they don't want to come back. If you truly believe in who Jesus is and what he offers, to want to share that love and that peace and that joy with those around us is an awesome thing to do. But we still have to be patient when people don't see don't see that in him or just don't choose or choose to go against it. And it's not hard to see how people come to that conclusion, right? Like if we look deeper at what Jesus is saying to his disciples at this table, we can see how people come to that conclusion. This is Luke 22, verse 26. It says, but among you, we read this before, but among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. This shows us the second reason we have to be patient. It's because it's hard to do. So it's hard to believe, and it's hard to do. It seems crazy, the ask that Jesus is making here. And in turn, for us today, it's difficult, it's challenging to upend your whole life and live in a way that's completely subversive to what culture says. One that is counter culture, counter to self-interest, counter to desire, counter to our own impulses. Even in our passage, we saw Jesus says, one of you guys is going to betray me. And they just talk about like, yeah, but which one of us is the best? Like they don't really understand this here. But what Jesus says here is we are to be different. And if you're in here and you don't follow Jesus or maybe you're considering it, that may be the objection that you've had for a long time. It's thinking, hey, this is too much to ask or how am I supposed to live like this? Or maybe, maybe it's even the simple thought of like, is this worth it? And no matter who you are in here right now, a follower of Jesus or not, we know it's not an easy thing to do. In Luke 9, earlier in, in, the, passage, in the book of Luke, we see this passage where Luke says, or I'm sorry, Jesus says, then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross daily and follow me. The people listening to Jesus when he said this were probably like, what, I have to be crucified every day? No, it's even harder than that, to give up your desires uh, for the goods of others every day. See, back in 2003, there was this New York Times article written about these thieves in Midtown that had stolen a 200-pound plaster sculpture of Jesus from a church. 200 pounds. 
Unfortunately for them, the cross was much bigger and they could not take that out of the church as well. And this gave the pastor the amazing cheesy opportunity to say in front of the whole congregation the next week, a lot of people want Jesus, but not a lot of people want the cross. But I think that's a good question for us today. A lot of people want Jesus, but not a lot of people want the cross. Where in your lives do you want Jesus, but not the cross? To serve unconditionally, to put away selfish desires, to lift others' needs before your own. In this world, it just seems wrong. And that's why he says, among you, it will be different. Following Jesus is about accepting him into your life to save you from your sin, but then comes you then comes the next step of you having him be Lord of your life. And that's why if you've seen a baptism here, we clap and we go nuts for that person because yes, we know that that is an amazing decision that they're making and we're happy for them. And it's because we realize that that is a decision that is hard to make and, we are, and that they're stepping into something that's not going to be easy but will be worth it. And so if that's, if that's something that you think is for you, of taking that next step in baptism, you can check that baptism box on that connection card that we talked about earlier and someone will call you this week to talk about what it looks like to give your life to Jesus. The way that Jesus interacts with people, the way that he lives his life, teaches us to be patient. But at the same time, it also leads us to our next point. It teaches us to lead with the end in mind. Lead with the end in mind. So far with this meal, we are talking about Jesus and his friends, his followers. But in our life, as we think about the people that we want to know Jesus one day, we likely think about our family. And Jesus shows us the same principle with them too. We can see it in a relationship that he has with his brother, James. So real quick, let's take a field trip. Take a field trip with me. Let's do a quick case study on Jesus and his brother. And I know for some of us, we're already like, what, Jesus had a brother? Like, what's the deal with that? That's right. Guess what? He also had sisters. I know, mind blown. You're gonna be a hit at parties now because you know that. That's not true, sorry. When we meet James in scripture, Jesus is teaching and people are amazed at his teachings. And they're like, yo, like, who is this dude? And then we get to Matthew 13. These are some people talking about Jesus. It says, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? It lists his brothers there. And it's the first time we see James. It's baby brother James. Then in Mark 3, we see James again. Jesus is teaching in the temple, and he's drawing big crowds, and people are packed in like sardines. And then we see Jesus' family show up, and we think like, oh, they're here to tell people to listen to Jesus, that he's wise, that he's worth following. But instead, they went to take him home, and they told people that he was out of his mind. Like, picture that. People are packed into this temple to hear Jesus, and they're like, oh, his family's here. And then they walk up, and they're like, sorry, sorry about him. He's crazy. Like, when he, when he gets tired, he thinks he's like savior of the world. Let me just take him out of here. Sorry about that. Like, that's what it was like. His brothers clearly weren't on board with what Jesus was doing. But Jesus doesn't give up. He leads with the end in mind. He keeps the end in mind. We see James again in John 7 when he tells Jesus he might as well go to the world and tell everybody who he is. And we think like, oh, maybe he's realizing the importance of his brother, of Jesus. But then scripture says he only said that to him because he didn't believe him. James was making fun of him. They went from apologizing for their brother, for their brother being crazy, to trying to hide him, to pushing him out in front of a bunch of people to make fun of him. But what's interesting, though, is we never see Jesus condemn James or his brothers. We never see him throw up his hands and give up, even though it must have been so frustrating wanting something so good for your family, even though they just don't get it. He has patience, and he also has the perspective of leading with the end in mind. He knows this matters, and he's going to show it to his brother. Now, we don't see James again until Galatians 2. Galatians 2, Paul, the author of Galatians, calls him a vital part of the movement of Jesus a pillar of the New Testament, leading the charge to help people know Jesus. And then we have this letter from James himself. James wrote a letter that's a book in the Bible called James, and this is how he opens his whole letter of his book. The the first verse of his book says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm James, a servant of God, and he doesn't stop there. The more interesting thing is the second thing he says there. James takes it a step further and says, I'm not only a servant of God, I'm a servant of Jesus. He's saying, I'm a servant of his. He owns me. My response to him is always yes because he is the Lord and he is who we should follow. We see James go from skeptic to servant, from making fun of to making much of, from I think he's crazy to he owns my life. And so here is the question for us. How did that happen? How did he go from skeptic to servant, from extreme unbelief to extreme belief? Well, I think we see it here in 1 Corinthians 15. This is how. It says, he, Jesus, was buried, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. 
Then he was seen by James. Jesus got up. He met with these women that were been following him. Then he met with Peter, then the disciples, then 500 other people. And then he had a personal little one-on-one with his brother, James. Talk about leading with the end in mind. Like, that must have been the biggest I told you so of all time. (laughs) He's saying, I've been patient with you, but you need to know what's at the end of the story or what can be at the end of your story. You may not be able to rise and die, or die and rise again, but we can still have the kind of urgency that leading with the end in mind instills, right? I mean, leading with the end in mind ensures that we won't simply take for granted opportunities that we have with those around us and, and develops a sense of urgency in us. That Jesus died for the sins of the world, yours and mine, and at the end, the end that we have in mind is that one day he's going to come back and those who believe in him will have everlasting life and those who don't will be eternally separated in suffering. And I know that sounds so far off and that sounds so heavy, but it's true. And there are still right here and right now implications to this. You see, we lead with the end in mind so that we can help our friend with crippling anxiety and fear and anxiousness know that that is not the end of their story, that there is a wonderful counselor out there in God who wants peace for them now and forever. We lead with the end in mind so that when a neighbor loses a loved one, we can remind them they won't be alone in this world and that there is a God out there who loves them endlessly. We lead with the end in mind so that we can overcome the awkward, overcome the fear, overcome the insecurity, the pushback, the apathy, the nerves, to tell our families that following Jesus isn't about rules and punishments, it's about freedom and grace. When we lead with the end in mind and with patience at the same time, we lead like Jesus but it does take both of those, patience and urgency. It takes patience and urgency. If we have patience for the people around us but no urgency, we can easily fall into what I'll call like holy laziness. This is how we get those relationships where we are at, we're like trying to show people that there's something better out there, but we've never really brought it up with them or we've never really challenged them to anything more. And maybe it's because we either don't feel or we forget the importance of it ourselves. And if we aren't careful, it turns into us knowing that there are people in our lives who are receptive to a life, to a life with Jesus. And we pray for five years that they will come to know him, but we never end up having the conversation with them until it's too late. Then on the flip side of the coin is someone who has all the urgency in the world, but none of the patience for people when they just don't get it or just don't want it. And this is where we get those like super out of pocket, like fire and brimstone people. Like the people are like, you're at Chick-fil-A with one of them and you're like, hey, should I get the regular chicken sandwich or the spicy chicken sandwich? And they're like, well, there's a lot of heat where you're going, so you might as well get the spicy one. It's like, whoa, like where did that come from? I know it's a pretty extreme example, whatever. We are called to be a mixture of both of these. Like how can we be patient, loving, gentle, kind, while still not undermining the massive importance that this carries. Like if we look back at our main text in Luke 22, we see Jesus as the perfect example for us. We see him here leading with the end in mind in Luke 22. This is what it says. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So what does this passage have to do with leading with the end in mind? I want to show us that when we play the long game, when we follow the same model that God does in the, in the grand scheme of life and how this passage is an example of that, you see this, this meal, this, this bread and this wine is actually, it's, like, it's an annual meal that Jesus and his followers would have had that people back then had all the time. You know, it was something that, it was called the Passover meal, something that people would do together annually. It's something, a reminder of something that happened in the Old Testament. And Jesus was having this meal with his followers in this passage. And in doing so, Jesus is actually taking part in an even bigger story of what God has been playing out. So I want us to see how long-term kingdom-minded our God is. See, this is going to be a lot, so try and stay with me. It's kind of supposed to be a lot to show you the craziness of what happens in this story. This is part of the part of the talk where we're going to zoom out and see the greater story of God, how God is playing the long game with all of us. All the way back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, God creates the world, and it's beautiful. Soon after, though, man goes astray and causes everything to break. We cause darkness in the world, and it's in this sin that what we see scholars call the first gospel, the first time the promise of Jesus is made the good news that he brings. God is talking to the serpent who represents Satan who tricked Adam and Eve in the garden and this is what he says in Genesis 3.15. 
He says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. God is saying that a boy will one day come from woman that will crush the one who hurt us, that will crush evil. And so Eve has a son, names him Cain. And they think like, hey, maybe this is the boy. But then he kills some people. It doesn't really go well. It's not great. Generations later, we have a boy named Noah. Some of you know his story. He's named Noah, which means rest, because they think maybe this is the boy that will bring rest to the curse of evil. But it's not him either. Then we have Abraham, but it wasn't him. So God tells Abraham to go after this one strip of land. It's like across the desert. So he goes across the Fertile Crescent. Some of you know that from class, right? He gets there. He has a son named Isaac, but it wasn't Isaac either. Isaac has a son named Israel, but it wasn't him. He then has 12 sons. Ten of them don't like one of their brothers, Joseph, which happens. So they sell him into slavery in Egypt, which happens, apparently. But it wasn't any of of them either. Those boys end up becoming the 12 tribes of the nation we now know as Israel. And then Egypt sees this nation rise and come to power, and they're like, what do we do with these guys? And so they enslave them. And then we get to Moses, who's not the boy either, But for context, that was thousands of years. Moses is a Jewish-born boy. He's raised in the house of Pharaoh, the Egyptian king who controls all all these Jewish slaves, which is not normal for him to live in in that house. He was only there because Pharaoh had been killing all of the Jewish babies at the time. And so Moses' mom, like, floats him down a river to save him, which normally I would not advocate for, but in this situation it worked out, I guess, because Pharaoh's daughter finds him and raises Moses in Pharaoh's house. So Moses grows up and doesn't like what he sees happening to his people, and he's commissioned by God to lead them out of slavery. And in doing so, God sends multiple plagues onto Egypt to force Pharaoh's hand to let the Jews go. These are things like livestock dying and and swarms of flies. There's even one where God makes it rain frogs. Like this, this is the kind of frog we're talking about. It's not like the cute frogs from the Baltimore Aquarium that you see with the spots that are apparently poisonous. This is what an Egyptian frog looks like. If you listen closely, you can hear him croaking. It's gross. Listen to that. Look at that thing. Ugh. <laughs> gotcha. My students loved that. <laughs> and after all this, even with that, Pharaoh still hasn't let them go. And so there's one last plague that comes, and it's, it's the death of every firstborn child in Egypt, which I know for us now is like, whoa, time out. Like, what's, what's the deal with this? And this is God's justice on display, and and we don't have time to get into how, but if you're interested, Mosaic did a sermon on this years ago called How Does God Save Us? And it's in our Is God Going to Help Me series that explains more of this. It's low-quality video because it was a while ago, but it's high-quality content, I promise. Now, in order for none of the firstborn Jews to be killed in this plague, they're commanded to sacrifice a lamb and put the blood of that lamb on their doorframe above their doors and on their doorposts. That way, when the spirit comes, like, they will be passed over. They'll see the sacrifice has been made, they'll be passed over, and they won't be affected by this plague. Out of this, Pharaoh concedes, and Moses leads the Jews out of Israel across the desert. From that moment on, Jewish people would celebrate this passing over uh, with wine as a representation of the blood that was put on the doorpost, the blood of the lamb. And they would celebrate with bread, which was representative of the bread that Jews would cook out, cook on the rocks in the in the desert, the hot rocks in the desert called matzah. But from that moment on, people would sit down and have this meal to remember, to celebrate this amazing thing that God did in saving them. Then, if you fast forward thousands of years, we come across this moment where Jesus is having that meal with his disciples, and it's that moment he is saying, remember that boy that was supposed to come and defeat sin and evil? Remember how how death came for everyone who was not saved by the blood of that lamb? I'm the fulfillment of all of those things. So God, thousands of years ago, uses all of that to get us to this moment in time at this table where Jesus is saying, I am that lamb. I am the one who will be sacrificed so that you won't have to face this punishment. And this gives us our last point this morning is to play the long game. Play the long game. Jesus is showing them the culmination of the pinnacle example of our God playing the long game, that we can be saved, that there is hope for those who follow him because he is about to die to be that sacrifice for us. This meal that Jesus is having with his followers is one where he is pointing us towards the event that our faith and our hope rests on, that's the death and resurrection of himself. And after all of his ministry, he uses a meal to share that news with them. 
and encourages them to use that meal, use that table, if you will, to remember, to share with others the need, that need to know that there is a God who loves them and died to save them. See, we host meals now because of the meal of the Last Supper and what Jesus promised to do and then did. Remember that meal I told you about uh, when I was at my grandpa's house and it was really loud? Me and my family were actually there for that meal, Passover meal. My dad's side of the family, they're all Jewish by, by heritage, and I remember uh, we're sitting there, we all have our, our matzah and our 30-minute Passover meal pamphlets, and I was new to faith in Jesus, and I had just learned this idea of how what happened in Egypt so long ago, so many years ago, connected to what Jesus did in the Last Supper and what Jesus was doing and what Jesus was explaining to his followers. And so now I know this story we're reading in these pamphlets is more than just a story. To me, it's, it's foreshadowing of what, James, what Jesus has done, and it's, it's foreshadowing of what Jesus had done for us, and it's what I just accepted he did for me, what I've been praying that my family will accept he did for them. But to the people around me, to my family who don't believe in him, it was just that. It was just a story. In the last couple of years now, I've been trying to play the long game with my family. And there are times where it is exhausting. And there are times where I'm so angry. And there are times where, where I just weep. Because all I want is the people that I love most in the world to know that there's someone else out there who has a greater love for them that doesn't even compare to mine. And I wish that earlier on I had these tools that we were talking about in this series of prayer for them and having a different presence with them. I wish all this time I had been patient with them and yet urgent with them of helping them know and love Jesus. And I'm trying now. I'm trying to be patient when they don't seem to get it or they get a little hostile or or judgmental or just don't care at all. But it's that thought of leading with the end in mind that keeps me going. And I believe that Jesus shows us that with his life. And God shows us that throughout the course of history as we've seen. And so, it's the example we should follow. Play the long game. They're worth it. To close, I want to show you this passage in 2 Peter. This is 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9. It says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. He's playing the long game. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's acting with urgency. Instead, he is patient with you. There's patience. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Play the long game. They're worth it. Let's pray. God, I'm thankful for who you are. I'm thankful for what you did so long ago and what you continue to do today. And I pray for the people in our lives that just don't know you. I pray for the people in here that don't know you. Pray that we understand it's not about rules and keeping everything together. It's, it's about grace, about forgiveness, about freedom, about what you did for us so long ago. God, help us be bold, help us be wise, help us be shrewd, help us do anything we can do to help other people know who you are because it's so worth it. Help us play the long game, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.